the cartoon history of the universe, volume 6. Who are these Athenians? The oracle at Delphi belonged originally to Gaia, the earth goddess, until the sun god Apollo, or his followers, killed her sacred python and seized the famous temple where the future was foretold. That much is myth. The riches of Croesus. Around 550 BC, a caravan from King Croesus of Lydia came to Delphi, bearing gifts for the god. These included 13,000 pounds of gold and gold alloy ingots, a golden lion, a 5,000 gallon golden bowl, another of silver, four silver caskets, gold and silver sprinklers, and a four-foot golden statue of Croesus's baker. After unpacking the goods, the Lydians asked the oracle this question. Did Croesus attack the Persians? Deep in the temple, the message was delivered to a priestess called the Pythia. The word is related to Python. Before giving her reply, the Pythia inhaled the fumes of burning bay leaves. until she felt divine inspiration. Oh my god! Some writers say the Pythia heard the god's whispers and the breezes blowing from a cleft in a rock. Looks more like the earth goddess than the sun god, doesn't it? Okay. Meanwhile, back in Lydia, Croesus was worried. Lord of Western Asia Minor, including the Greek cities of Ionia, this king was rich. His family had invented coinage. What's wealth without security? But just to the east, his brother-in-law, King of the Medes, had been toppled by some obscure tribe called the Persians. <laughs> Croesus owed it to his brother-in-law to retaliate, but he had a lot to lose, and so he sent to Delphi and nervously waited. Oh, I sure hope the treasure arrived in one piece. Ooh, the pirates have just been awful lately. Why does everything have to take six months? Long before coinage was invented, people already used gold and silver as a medium of exchange. Precious metals are rare and durable, and they make pretty jewelry. But how to know if gold was genuine? You had to bite it. Pure gold is soft. Now all of my crowns are dented. So, around 700 BC, the Lydian kings began stamping lumps of gold with the royal seal as a guarantee of purity. The first coins. Today, our coins are base alloy. Our dollars are paper. Money makes ugly jewelry. All that's left is the government guarantee. But of what? A guarantee to print more money. Presently, the Pythia took up a laurel branch and spoke in an unearthly voice. So, like, if Croesus attacks the Persians, he'll destroy our great empire, okay? No one knows exactly what Croesus said when this message reached him at Sardis. <laughs> what kind of answer is that? Which empire? That was the whole point! Answer like that, you might as well flip a coin. Uh, anyone got a coin? So, Croesus made the first move leading his Lydians across the border into Median territory, wasting the crops and enslaving the inhabitants. I can't get over that greedy oracle. Soon the Persian army arrived, along with the people whom Croesus had driven off the land. For one long day, they fought the Lydians. Then Croesus decided war season was over for the winter. See you next spring. The Persians disagreed. Uh, let's surprise them. Keeping out of sight, they followed the Lydians home. Croesus had only enough time to write a couple of letters before he realized that Sardis was surrounded. Sincerely yours... Uh, what? When the Lydians came out to fight, the Persians gave them another surprise. Camel! Yeah. <laughs> the Lydian horses turned tail and bolted for home. But the Persians were mountain men. They went right up Sardis's walls. The city fell. Croesus was set atop a pyre with 14 Lydian princes. <laughs> then...
The princes were burned, but Croesus and Sardis were spared. This showed the power and mercy of Persia and its Shah Cyrus, who now commanded the riches of Croesus. I just wanted to say thanks for the great empire. Meany, meany. The Persians moved next against Babylon. This was Nebuchadrezzar's new rebuilt Babylon, more splendid than ever, with hanging gardens, the Ishtar Gate, ziggurats, palaces, and endless brick tenements, home of the captive Jews whom we last saw in Volume 4. According to the biblical account, the crown prince Belshazzar saw the handwriting on the wall during a palace banquet and sent for a Jewish sage to decipher it. This was the prophet Daniel. He read, Manny, Manny, tackle you person. Meaning, Manny, you have been weighed, tackle, and found one thing, you person, by the Farsi. I, Persian. Such are the letters written by the angel's fiery hands. Angel? Did you see any angel? Not exactly. It's a metaphor, Jack. Upstream from Babylon, Cyrus's men diverted the Euphrates River. Waited along the city wall by night. And were inside Babylon's bronze gates before they could be locked. The Bible says the city fell just as Belshazzar's banquet was winding up. Many, many people, you person! Then, in another great public relations move, Cyrus allowed all captive peoples to go home and practice their own religion. Hey, I wouldn't force my religion on anyone. <laughs> I can barely stand it myself. Some of them said they'd rather stay. The origin of the Iraqi Jews. We've got this little import-export thing going. You can't really afford to close down. Others returned to Jerusalem, where they found a whole new set of inhabitants. It's an old problem. <laughs> a great empire. So, who were these Persians? Originally, their forebears were Indo-European nomads known as the Aryans, from beyond the Caspian Sea. Moving south, these people divided into several groups, including the Medes and the Persians. The Medes, who lived in Assyrian territory, became civilized early, while the Persians were still pretty wild. They live in a yurt, are covered with dirt, and have only one shirt. P.U. Still, after a century or two in their new home, the Persians had developed their own religion, customs, and carpets, of course. Ooh. Their religion, as preached by Zarathustra of Baal, divided all things into two principles, good and evil. Balk today. Good was identified with the one god, Ahura Mazda, who was realized in fire. While evil was darkness. Their dead were neither buried nor cremated, but simply exposed to the elements. Very illogical. <laughs> the ministers of the faith were the Magi, hence our word magic. <laughs> the worst sin was to tell a lie. Criminals always confessed. Heroes, did you chop down the peach tree? Yes, Father. Their habit was to reconsider soberly any decision they had made while drunk. And vice versa. This could go... I... 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 Their retail trade was tightly controlled. Of the Greek marketplaces, Cyrus said, Who are these people who have special places where they go to cheat each other? Hey. After their conquest, the Persians brought home every shrub and flower of the realm, planting formal gardens called Pyridaza, from which we derive paradise. The Persian Empire began with the conquest of Cyrus the Great. In 549 BC, he conquered his cousins, the Medes. 
The median king had lost popular support when he dished up a nobleman's son for supper, and so the Medes had no stomach for fighting. As we saw, that battle brought in Croesus of Lydia. <laughs> After taking Lydia, Ionia, and Babylonia, Cyrus moved on to the lands to the east. He died in battle somewhere in Central Asia and was buried in this modest tomb, still standing in Iran. The Persians used to say Cyrus was a father, Cambyses was a master, and Darius was a shopkeeper. 1,620,400 and 2? A bean counter! Cyrus's son, Cambyses, added Egypt to the empire, went horribly insane, and died. His story is full of action, cruelty, and some interesting facts about crossing the Arabian Desert. But we don't have room. Sorry. You can read all about it in Herodotus. This was the end of Egypt's independence for over a thousand years. <laughs> After Cambyses, Persia was ruled by two magi, who were killed by seven aristocrats. <coughs> the seven made a pact. The crown goes to the one whose horse neighs first at dawn tomorrow. <coughs> that night, a servant secretly visited the mares. He's <coughs> good. <coughs> And the winner is Darius! And so Darius became king of Persia. After ordering a massacre of the Magi, Darius turned to the task of organizing the vast conquests of Cyrus and Cambyses into a well-run <laughs> empire. The first to embrace all the ancient civilizations of the Middle East except Arabia. So, like, okay? This map shows its greatest extent, about 500 BC. The realm was divided into 20 provinces, or satrapies, each one ruled by a Persian lord, the satrap. As under Cyrus, local customs were respected, as long as those taxes kept coming in, accurate to the last golden Doric. Darius also built roads and established a postal service famous for its reliability. Trade with China probably became regular. He built a new palace at Susa, and began a new capital from scratch. Persepolis is its Greek name. Darius's personal spies, the king's eyes, checked upon the satraps. Soon, the whole weight of this empire was to come down on tiny Greece. Ionian Revolt The trouble began with a revolt in the cities of Ionia. Ionia, as readers of Volume 5 may recall, was the part of the Asian coast colonized by Greek settlers around 1000 BC. During the 600s and 500s, Ionia thrived, as city bosses called tyrants promoted trade and hired the first Greek philosophers to help them think. I love it! Around 560 BC, Croesus brought Ionia under Lydian rule, and 20 years later, it became part of the Persian Empire. This turned out to be great for the philosophers, who got access to Eastern learning. This included the idea of the basic unity of the cosmos. Most Greeks didn't buy it, though. God is one and formless. Come on! Zeus wears a beard, Athena has a pet owl, Apollo has a wart on his left arm. Imperial rule was less happy for the common people who kept getting drafted to fight Persia's battle. First, there was Cambyses' invasion of Egypt. 
Then, there was an awful campaign with Darius across the Danube against the blood-drinking, hemp-smoking, horse-riding Scythians who roamed the steppe. Darius's army barely got out alive, and many were left behind. The last straw was a fruitless expedition against the island of Nexus, an especially unpopular trip because it was meant to overthrow a democratic government and put the aristocrats back in. The grumbling turned to mutiny when the troops failed to get paid. The man responsible for the failed raid was Aristagoras, governor of Miletus. Now in trouble with the Persians, Aristagoras suddenly became a Democrat and a rebel. Get their poison! Before they get me! He stepped down as governor and gave all power to the people. They promptly slaughtered the Persian garrison. Just splash the ballot! As the revolt spread along the coast, Aristagoras headed for Greece, seeking aid. In reply, Athens sent 1,000 hoplites to Ionia. Athenians and Ionians marched up the river to Sardis and set the thatched capital on fire. Horse, tell the king! When Darius got word, his reaction was understandable. Athenians? Well, who are they? He shot an arrow into the sky with a prayer. Oh God, grant that I may punish the Athenians. And he ordered one of his servants to repeat three times nightly before dinner. Sire, remember the Athenians. <laughs> so, who were these Athenians? Early Athens. Unlike most other Greeks, the Athenians had always been in one place. Athens, city of the goddess Athena, and the surrounding countryside, Attica. Famous for its lousy soil, only good for making pots. In the turmoil after the Trojan War, when other Greeks were migrating and butchering each other, Athens remained unconquered. Some Athenians did flee across the Aegean to found the twelve cities of Ionia, and later the women of Athens borrowed Ionian styles. The story goes that some Athenians had gone to war, and all but one were killed. The last man brought home the bad news. The good news is, here I am. The tearful widows pulled the pins from their peplos, the traditional Greek dress, and pricked him to death. From that point on, Athenian women had to wear the long, tailored, and pinless Ionian gown. Hey, try this. The latest from Ionia is very chic. Please? For centuries after the Trojan War, life in Attica followed a dependable pattern. Boring. Every year, the poor farmer borrowed seeds from his rich neighbor, the hippie, equal horseman. Please, please, your extreme largeness, render unto your faithful, loyal, devoted pal, me, a few kernels of barley. The borrower took the grain home. You're the most generous of men, <laughs> hippie. He plowed and planted his own plot. I may be in debt, but I've got a little land, a little leisure, and a big ox. At harvest time, he repaid the loan with grain, and by working part-time for the hippie. It feels good to be generous, doesn't it? But these dark ages were bound to end. Trade picked up. Money, that Lydian invention, followed. And where money goes, can conflict be far behind? During the 600s, Athenians along the coast began getting into commerce, which was picking up everywhere. They have a cheap grain, drink, it's gold, and slaves. What would you like? A piece of the action. They bought land with their gold and farmed it with their slaves. It's called modern management. This brought them into competition with their rich inland neighbors, the old hippies. Slave drivers with money. How can we keep up with that? How do you compete with modern management techniques? I intend to squeeze the poor. The hippies began enslaving debtors and seizing their farms whenever their debts were not repaid. Clearly, <laughs> a step forward, the result of free competitive market forces. Very reassuring. 
So the Athenians did what they always did in a crisis. They held a meeting. The assembly decided that Athens needed a new system of laws to stop such outrages. The particular outrage they had in mind was not slavery in general. It was the enslavement of Athenians, for debt or any other reason. We're meant to have slaves, not be them. Yeah. Solon, a liberal landlord, was appointed to draw up a system of laws to satisfy all sides. Solon annoyed the rich by canceling debts, freeing the Athenian slaves, and giving the vote to all adult males, regardless of wealth. He annoyed the poor by failing to return them their land and by reserving government jobs for the rich. <laughs> then, having annoyed everyone equally, he left town for ten years. And the feuding between coast and countryside went right on. We screws you could have laws and anarchy at the same time. Finally, the hill people, poorest of the poor, to whom Solon had given nothing but a vote, got fed up. At least a slave knows where his next meal is coming from. They approached Pisistratus, a successful general, and offered to make him tyrant of Athens. How very flattering. I accept. Out of the hills they came, with a tall girl dressed as Athena, giving her blessings to Pisistratus. Athenians always liked good theater. Come on, give it up! Is it art or is it life? Despite the appealing theatrics, the Athenians ran Pisistratus and his entourage out of town. Pisistratus fled, bought gold mines, invested his profits in a well-equipped private army, and returned. Okay, let's try it without the gun. In 546, Pisistratus was proclaimed tyrant of Athens. Cheer now, and sound sincere. The tyrant suppressed the long-simmering feuds, banished his enemies and gave their land to the poor, enforced Solon's laws, promoted grape growing, the Dionysian rites, and the theater. See Volume 5. And encouraged the export of Athenian wine. He's giving tyrants a good name. After 16 years of this tyranny, Attica was peaceful, productive, and farmed by a sizable middle class. When Pisistratus died, his two sons Hippias and Hippakos became co-tyrants, but Hippakos was murdered. Some people have no appreciation of the benefits of tyranny, which made Hippias turn paranoid, repressive, and, well, Tyrannical. Hmm. Wonder what Dad would have done. Arrest everybody! Some exiled Athenians began plotting to overthrow the tyrant. How do you overthrow an entrenched military dictatorship? With another entrenched military dictatorship. All agreed. They needed help from Sparta, the strongest, meanest city in Greece. But what would persuade Sparta to help? A religious lot, those Spartans. They'll always listen to the gods. But how on earth can we influence the immortal gods to intervene in the affairs of mere mortals, us? Bribe a priest! The exiles lavished money on a magnificent new temple at Delphi, faced with gleaming white marble. While it was under construction, they had a few words with the Pythia and her priests. Really? Oh my god. Oh my god. Suddenly, every Spartan petitioner began hearing the same uncryptic oracular utterance. Liberate Athens! Me? So the Spartans liberated Athens. Like, liberate Athens already, okay? And then, most miraculously, the Spartans went home. Leaving the Athenians to govern themselves. At which point, the old feuds broke out immediately. Communist oligarch! It was the usual fight. The rich, as usual, thought the government was theirs by right. But the lower classes, grown strong under Pisistratus, declared Athens a democracy, ruled by the popular assembly. We'll see about that. The aristocratic party called back the Spartans, staged a coup, and banished 700 families with democratic leanings. 
Maybe our leanings were too obvious. Soon, the 700 came back. The people rose in arms and blockaded the Spartans and aristocrats on the Acropolis. The Spartans were let go, but the native enemies of democracy were killed to a man. Now I'll have no more talk about the excesses of democracy. This bloody event, called the Athenian Revolution, finally established the famous democracy. How this government worked, we'll leave aside for now. Just saying that, thanks to the tyrant's enforcement of Solon's laws, Athens already had an unusually large and well-fed infantry of hoplites. Now the Athenians were fired up, and they set out to settle some old scores. Athens, like most Greek cities, was on bad terms with all of its neighbors. Oh, it's trudge, trudge, trudge. We're off to settle our trudge. They battled the Corinthians. <laughs> Thebans, the Aeginetans, the Euboeans, and beat them all. Even the Spartans were scared now. We created a monster. It was just at this point that the Ionians arrived, looking for help in their revolt against Persia. Strike a blow for democracy, you Athenians! The Athenians, full of success, said yes, and that's why Sardis was burned and why Darius had indigestion. Remember the Athenians, Darius? Yeah, yeah. Marathon. So, now it's 490 BC. Darius's navy had crushed the Ionian revolt. Miletus was sacked, its citizens enslaved. But amazingly, Darius let the Ionians have what they wanted. Democratic rule. So long as they pay their taxes, they can have metric rule for all I care. Then, the Imperial Navy set sail for Greece, ready for revenge against Athens. Well, almost ready. The ships were smashed on the rocks by the Aegean's tricky winds. But they tried again. Guided by Pisistratus' son, Hippias, the Persians landed some 30,000 men near Athens on a plane called Marathon. Oh, boom at last. In the year 493, the playwright Phrynichus wrote The Fall of Miletus, an account of the Ionian Revolt. Something in this play offended the Athenians, and Phrynichus was assessed a heavy fine. Did you hear about Phrynichus? Now that's a tragedy. From then on, Athenian tragedians almost always took their subjects from the myths and legends. So I says to myself, Sophocles, there's no way Oedipus can sue you for slander. As we have seen, Athens had made enemies of all its neighbors. Ho oh, hum, the Persians have come to smash Athens. Remind me to send them a thank you note. Still, an Athenian runner named Pheidippides was sent to Sparta. Pheidippides made the 150 miles in just two days, hallucinating as he went, they say. Wow, I see thousands of people jogging, jogging. I see special running shoes with stripes, running magazines, running therapy, all because of me. I must be losing my mind. The Spartans said they'd be glad to help, but not right away. The Persians are coming. We're having a festival. Can't stop till the full moon! Mustn't offend the gods! And so, 5,000 Athenian hoplites with their armor carriers and 2,000 men from Plataea camped on the heights above Marathon and waited. One reason they waited so long is that they had 10 generals instead of one. Today it's my turn to be general! No, mine! Mine! Real Democrat! The great mystery is why the Persians also waited. What mystery? Don't you know how to read entrails? See? Wait! Old Hippias, they say, was seeing omens in everything. <laughs> <gasps> ah! Lost a tooth! It's in the sand! Ye gods! Foreign bodies will be buried here! And that dream! I slept with my mom! Meaning, I'll rest in my native soil! Oh! Finally, on the tenth day, the Athenian general Miltiades took command and ordered the attack. Forget those Spartans! 
outnumbered by three to one, the Greeks charged down the slope. They covered a mile and a half on the run in heavy armor. The impact must have been tremendous. Historians like to say the Greeks won the Battle of Marathon because they were fighting for their homes and way of life. Yet the Persians conquered many peoples who were fighting for the same. Can it talk about it? Not right now! But the Athenians were probably better fed, better armed, and in better shape from fighting their neighbors so much. After many hours, the Persians broke for their ships with the Greeks in hot pursuit. When it was all over, 6,400 Persians had died and only 192 Athenians. These are thought to be the real numbers, not just an official body count. A couple of days later, the Spartans came, congratulated, and left. Good job, and goodbye. Silver and ships. When the news hit Susa, Darius hit the roof. He ordered every satrap from Egypt to India to prepare for a vast invasion of Greece. Three years were spent building up supply depots, drafting and training troops, etc., etc. You're going to Greece, but I'm already on the moon. Then, in 486, Darius died, leaving the throne to his son, Xerxes. Remember? <laughs> the Athenians. Oh, father. Why bother? For several years, Xerxes was busy with a revolt in Egypt and forgot about Greece. Meanwhile, back in Athens, Miltiades, hero of Marathon, was accused of misuse of public funds and arrested. He died in jail of gangrene, causing the Athenians to ponder the fickleness of fate and others to ponder the fickleness of Athens. It's no place to be a hero. The democracy had brought a new leader to power. Not an aristocrat, but the son of a vegetable vendor, Themistocles by name. Eat your veggies, Athenians! Now it happened that the slaves working the Athenian silver mines, a most awful place with three-foot shafts and twelve-hour shifts, had struck an especially rich vein. Some people wanted simply to divide up the surplus, while Themistocles proposed to spend it on warships. Themistocles, who had ostracized all his political rivals, carried the vote. With warships, we can get all the silver we need. By the year 480, Athens had great shipyards and 200 triremes, as many as the rest of Greece combined. Under Athenian law, in any given year, the people had the right to banish one citizen for any reason they pleased, by majority vote. What'd I do? Nothing! We just don't like you very much! This was called ostracism because the names were written on potsherds, Ostraka in Greek, one of many Ostraka bearing Themistocles' name. After ten years, the ostracized citizen was free to return without further penalty. Hey, welcome home! It's so nice to have you back to kick around. Acropolis now! Meanwhile, Xerxes couldn't make up his mind about Greece. His younger friends urged him on, while Darius's old advisors said to forget it. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. But three times the king had a dream. A phantom came and said, Go to Greece! But why? It's lovely in the spring. So Xerxes decided to go to Greece. Advisors I can always be had, but a phantom? Besides the preparations made by Darius, Xerxes ordered a canal dug across the neck where the navy had been wrecked in 490, and a bridge of ships built across the Hellespont. Things went wrong right away. Canal banks kept caving in on the diggers. I told you, this makes waste, I said. But we're doing this and no, we just wanted to whip and whip. Except for the Phoenicians, who started twice as wide at the top as the intended width at the bottom. As for the bridge, just when the hundreds of ships were lashed together, a storm blew all away. Xerxes had the engineers beheaded and got new ones. Don't repeat. 
His mistake. <laughs> he also ordered the waters to be whipped and cursed. Oh, ow! Sorry! The bridge was rebuilt. The ships attached by cables of linen and papyrus, each some three feet thick. It was covered with planks, then with dirt, and walls were made to prevent the horses from seeing the water and taking fright. The army itself was immense. Millions by ancient accounts, hundreds of thousands according to modern historians. Then, add on the countless servants, wives, mistresses, camp followers, and don't forget the pack animals. And it all adds up to one thing. A long wait at the watering hole. Hey, hurry it up! In the spring of 480 BC, the army left Sardis. Xerxes himself rode in the center with 1,000 horsemen before and another 1,000 behind, plus 10,000 immortals, the king's personal guard, whose spears were capped by gold and silver pomegranates. Our modern Shah also called his bodyguards immortals. Near Troy, they reached a river that ran dry before everyone could get a drink. That night, there was panic in the camp. It's a suicide mission! The next morning, the army pushed onward. When they reached the Hellespont, Xerxes reviewed the troop and had a conversation with his old uncle Artabanus, who had been against this trip all along. What do you think now? I'm filled with dread, for the two mightiest powers in the world are against you! Will that? The land and the sea! It is also said that on reflecting that all these men would be dead in 100 years, Xerxes wept. After crossing the bridge, which took a week, the army headed for Greece, drinking rivers dry and eating everything in sight. At least they didn't ask for seconds. The Delphic Oracle was flipping out. She said, Divine Salamis, you'll bring dust to women's sons when the corn is scattered and the harvest is gathered in? God! In Athens, Themistocles tried to put this in the best light. She said, Divine Salamis. Is that so bad? Divine Salamis? As in holy balonies? <laughs> Many Greek cities caved in and offered earth and water to Persia as a sign of submission. I got troubles enough! Vowing to deal with the traitors later, Athens and Sparta organized the resistance. The plan! The Greek navy would try to hold the straits at Artemision, while the army fortified the isthmus leading to the Peloponnese. Meanwhile, a small force went ahead to make a first-line stand at Thermopylae, a narrow pass between the mountains and the sea. When the Persian scouts reached Thermopylae, they found a wall, a couple of thousand assorted hoplites, including 300 Spartans having their hair done. A Spartan in exile with Xerxes explained that this was how his countrymen prepared to deal death. Into hair, eh? Are they into boys, too? Well, as a matter of fact... Never one to rush, Xerxes sat for a few days to give the Spartans a chance to be sensible. But they didn't go away. <sighs> I tried to be nice. Finally, he ordered the attack. For days, his best troops were driven back over and over and over. Then, Xerxes heard about another pass through the hills above Thermopylae. That night, he sent his bowmen up, guided by a Greek, Ephialtes, who became a famous traitor for his trouble. At least I'll go down in history. In the morning, Greek scouts reported the movement to the defenders. The Spartan chief, King Leonides, sent everyone home, except 300 Spartans and their 900 servants and armor carriers. Let us face death together! Give me the armor! As arrows blackened the sky above, the Persian infantry, driven by whips, attacked below. 
The Spartans fought back with spears and swords, then with hands and teeth, until all were overwhelmed. Now the Persians knew what they were up against. Suicidal hairdressers. Incidentally, historians since Herodotus have ignored the 900 servants who fell with their Spartan masters. And this battle is often called the last stand of the 300. We was here. On the same day as the land battle, the navies were fighting at Artemisia. After suffering heavy losses, the Greeks were forced to retreat down the coast to the island of Salamis, near Athens. Merrily, 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 like the party. Oh, rather fun. This meant that nothing now stood between Xerxes and Athens. So naturally, the Athenians held a meeting. The question, stay and fight, or clear out of the way? What a question! Miltiades' son, Timon, led a symbolic parade of young hippies who laid down their horses' bridles in the temple. Meaning, don't fight with cavalry, but with ships. Breaks my heart, really, to let that navy rabble get the glory. But let's be reasonable. So Athens was evacuated, except for a few diehards holed up on the Acropolis. Xerxes took his time getting there. We have to waste the countryside. Very, very carefully. But finally, the Imperials reached Athens, stormed the Acropolis, killed the diehards, and torched the temple. Mission accomplished. Are you happy now, Dad? Then, Xerxes joined his navy, which had sailed into the Bay of Phalarum, just around the corner from Salamis. Now, a word about the Greek navy. Although nearly half the ships were from Athens, the other allies couldn't bear the thought of taking orders from an Athenian. Especially not the pussy son of a vegetable vendor! They insisted on a Spartan leader. Themistocles, the Athenian admiral, went along, but secretly passed cash to Eurybiades, the Spartan, to keep him friendly. Your hand, Eurybiades! When word came to Salamis that Athens was burned, the Peloponnesians wanted to head south again. Yes, a more southerly position would be more secure. Brazil, for example. Themistocles used his strongest arguments to make the Spartans stay. If you leave, we'll pull out our ships. Yes, yes, I see your point. I mean point. But the other southerners definitely had the urge for going. Why defend Athens? When there is no Athens! Then Themistocles pulled his most famous trick. I'll force these to the fight! He sent a secret message to the Persian High Command. In effect, it said, The Greeks are afraid and about to flee. Block their exits and they are yours. And it's signed, Your friend, Themistocles. That day, Xerxes and his admirals held their council of war. That night, their ships silently moved into the channels around Salamis. The news reached the Greeks in the middle of the night. Hey, take it easy. Here's my plan. At dawn, they rode out in single file. First the Spartans, then the Allies, and finally the 200 Athenian triremes. These triremes with three banks of oars were heavier and slower than the Phoenician or Egyptian ships of the Imperial Navy but strong and equipped with a vicious underwater beak. The plan was to draw the enemy into confined water, so the Greeks came about, facing front, and waited. The Imperials advanced, and the Greeks backed up, forming a great U-shape. When they had practically backed onto the beach, an immense shout went up from Salamis. Stop backing up! Are you crazy? At this point, the Greeks attacked. Watching from a nearby hill, Xerxes took down the names of his bravest and most cowardly admirals for future rewards and beheadings. Admirable! Oh, admirable, admirable! The Persians' problem soon became clear. Fresh ships rushing in to impress the king kept getting snarled with damaged vessels trying to get away. Slow down! Slow down! Now, what's yours? Onward! Row! By late afternoon, the Imperial Navy was being slaughtered. Hmm, can I behead all of them? This is when Xerxes started to pack. Hey, it's September already. I gotta go. What are we doing here? Let's go. Pass my bedtime. Give me a cab. Let me out of here. By land and sea, the Imperials left, except for 80,000 men left behind to finish the conquest next year. Lovely country, Greece. Must come again sometimes. In the off-season.
and Themistocles sent Xerxes another note. Beloved king, I'm terribly sorry things didn't work out. You'll be happy to know that I restrained the others from chasing your tail all the way back to the Hellespont. With warmest wishes, Themistocles. I must do him a kindness one day. Having some free time now, Themistocles toured the Greek islands demanding gold to pay for the war and to line his own bust, they say. On the island of Andrus, this was the dialogue. We Athenians have two powerful gods on our side, persuasion and compulsion. We Andrians have two useless gods who refuse to leave us alone, poverty and inability. Finally, the commanders who had fought at Salamis met to divide the loot and award a prize to the most valiant man of the campaign. In the voting, it seemed everyone put himself first and Themistocles second, and so no prize was given. Sorry, Themistocles, old chump. Almost. Give yourself a prize. If you haven't already. Can you believe this? Meanwhile, the Athenian refugees were still camping on Salamis and elsewhere, unable to go home because a large Persian army still occupied Attica. Mardonius, the Persian general, sent a messenger to Salamis, proposing an alliance between Athens and Persia. You burned our city, we burned yours, now we're even. Besides, together we could rule Greece. An Athenian counselor, Lysidas, suggested putting Mardonius's proposal to a popular vote. For saying this, Lysidas and his whole family were stoned to death. Oh, this is voting? Mardonius and his army were slaughtered next spring, 479, at Plataea, the last battle on Greek soil, of this war anyway. The Spartan commander Pausanias invited the other officers to see Mardonius's lavish tent with this laconic remark. You see what fools these were who live like this yet come to rob us of our poverty. And so Greece was saved. Xerxes spent some time in Sardis dallying with an officer's wife before returning home. My empire is still <laughs> immense. I'll bet. The imperial veterans went home. Krishna, how is Greece? Very odd. Their oracles smoke bay leaves instead of regular old hemp. The Ionians, who began this volume as subjects of Croesus, ended as independent city-states under the protection of the Athenian navy. And the Athenians got back their city, or what was left of it. Next, an empire without an emperor. <laughs>